Hello and welcome to the Cardiff Central podcast with me, Karen Harris. Uh, Dan Pierce is here with me. I've never called you Dan Pierce before in my oh, life. Dan is name. here with me. Yeah, out of every life, whatever you want to call it. Um, no Hardy this week. He's, uh, well, I think he's off gallivanting, isn't he, Dan? Yeah, he's in Butlins or something, which uh, I bet that's a right laugh with a bunch of toddlers and stuff. <laughs> Yeah, if you listen, I enjoy enjoy. <laughs> yeah, but Lens. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it was a we're, we're we're both in good spirits after a very good week for Cardiff. Uh, spoke to Griff Reese after the Cardiff regional game. He said eleven points out of ten for Cardiff and Cardiff Rags, um, which was uh, yeah obviously five points for the region and six points for the Rags. Uh, where do you want to start, Dan? Um, well, we'll go for the, the the main game on Friday night first, I guess, as as the big one of the weekend. And yeah, it was it was a weird one, really, because it was five points and job done and all the boxes were ticked in that sense. But walking out the ground, it was kind of like, I'm not sure if if you I think if you didn't know the result and you watched everybody leave in the Ams Park, you probably wouldn't have guessed that we got five points, really, on Friday night. It was it was an odd game. It wasn't wasn't a classic by any stretch of the imagination. I thought. First half, it was just job done. You know, 17-3, I think it was, at half time, Three tries. We were the, there 22, four times, scored three tries. They didn't really look like scoring at all in the first half. And then, yeah, I think I think Jockey said in his presser this week something about um, that we sat up too early, maybe, or that we sort of went went to, to manage the game too early. But it, it, just, it just felt like, yeah, we went to sort of park the bus and... And it didn't really do a very good job of that, to be honest. It was like, like sat deeper, kicked a lot, but kicked really poorly. And then where we were sitting so deep, we made a lot of tackles. I think the URC website's got us about 240-odd. And so when you're trying to kick to compete after making 240 tackles, lo and behold, your legs aren't being very good to chase after it. So, um, yeah, odd, slightly odd tactically second half. But I'm happy to put it down to, you know, new... Got like a lot of new faces, new combinations, a side that didn't win a lot last year and isn't, you know, it's a bit of a cliche thing about knowing how to win and all that sort of stuff. But it is true that, you know, these lads lost a lot of these tight games last year. In, and round one, Benetton last year, we were cruising at 60, 65 minutes and managed to lose that. So, yeah, there's a lot, there's a bit of scar tissue there uh, to overcome. But I thought the boys dug in, did what they had to do, get away with five points. Uh, to steal a line from Craig Bellamy and, and football, you know, that's probably the worst we'll play, I think, hopefully, and <laughs> it can only get better. But yeah, I, yeah, I, it, won't, it won't be one that we'll talk about in a few weeks. I think we'll have forgotten about it by then. But it's a win that we didn't get last season, which is a big thing as well. That, you know, if, if you're comparing results against teams that we drew out there, so a win in this one is, uh, is what we want to form, what we got. Yeah, um, as you mentioned, a lot of new faces, uh, three of them, four with the count sheet, getting on the score sheet with uh, Stevens, Dan Thomas and McAnally, along with, yeah, as I said, Callum Sheedy getting a conversion out of one out of four, which you've probably been disappointed with. But overall, uh, let's start with Sheedy because it was a very good performance, two of the tries set up through brilliant kicks. Um, you know, as you said, Cardiff were incredibly clinical in that first half, three entries, uh, sorry, four entries, as you said. Three, three of them, or two of them, came from kicks. One cross-field kick, one little nick in behind, which was lovely, I thought. Um, overall, what did you make of his performance? Because there's been a lot of talk about him coming in, obviously, against to be a player of the season last season, Who and Sheedy stood up. Yeah, I, I said it on the pod last week, you know, about the, the debate between the two. And I get the sort of romanticism around De Beer holding the jersey and all that sort of stuff. And he did do a great job. But, you know, ultimately, Sheedy is a better player in all facets of the game. I thought he showed that on Friday night, really. You know, the the composure, the vision, the execution. The, yeah, that, that, that left foot kick is stunning. It's, you know, to drop it onto your weaker foot and perfectly place it in behind in a two-on-two two there for Stevens. A great finish from him. You know, he's he is rapid as a bloke. But yeah, the, I think the only disappointment really was that he we didn't get the ball in his hands often enough, really. You know, we, we kicked a lot from nine and didn't play at all, really, in the middle third of the pitch. Um, so we, we didn't really see what he could do through extended phase play and, and building up that pressure. But yeah, the, the cross kicks... I think the impressive thing about that is it's it's a bit of chaos on that pitch at that moment. There's been Ben Thomas and Lilo have linked up nicely to to make the line break. There's 
zebra lads all over the shop trying to get back in in uh, in defence. We're not in any particular shape uh, through midfield, but you know he takes the ball. The zebra defender flies up. He sort of double pumps him and puts it perfectly over the top. You can't, you know that that is the difference between sort of you know a, a good ten and a, a test level ten is keeping your head in those situations. So yeah, I think. We, we do need to work on getting him the ball more conversion wise. The only thing I can think is that maybe the rest of the team don't like him very much because I kept giving him these conversions on the touch <laughs> line. Um, but, uh, but no, it was, it was a, t I don't, don't know. Obviously people were there would have felt it, but if for watching on telly, it was quite a tough night to kick in actually on Friday night. It was similar Thursday as well for the college and the, and the rags game that the town was quite calm. And then you got into the arms park and somebody was, pumping a massive industrial fan from somewhere down from the uh, down from the town end across the river it was it was and it was like proper gusting as well there wasn't any regularity to that win so yeah she we know she he's a good enough goal kicker so I'm not concerned in that sense but i i thought i the only thing i would say is that he got man of the match i th i thought there were other players who probably should have got it but it did felt like because of the narrative, I think you've won that man of the match before kickoff. Potentially, <laughs> prodigal son returns yeah. and all that. Sort of stuff. All he needed to do was the IRS at the end, and he got player of the season. Um, but yeah, I think I think they were yeah, as you say, it was a bit of romanticism. A couple of other players, I thought Dan Thomas, McNally both played really well on debut um, or pro well, competitive debut, depending on what you want to call it. Um, a couple of other lads as well. Uh, what, what do you make of Danny Southworth? Obviously, that was. It was an interesting selection, perhaps, you know, when we didn't pick on the pod, but um, along with every other pick there's ever been. <laughs> <laughs> but um, what, what did you make of his performance and a couple of the other guys up front? Yeah, I mean, first 60, 65 or so, Scrum was absolutely fine. We didn't see a huge amount of Southworth. He shows some nice hands where the Zebra player ends up behind his own goal line and uh and has a bit of a shoveled kick out and to take that from from that distance is very nice hands and a good carry but yeah i mean set piece wise we were pretty good i thought all all through the night on friday night you know uh southworth belcher and, and as there was a front row were solid at scrum time mcnally like you said a, a terrific mall defender really gave zebra nothing in that that uh, area at all it was Although we didn't, I didn't quite. I don't think we quite got through to sack any of them. He, a couple of times they held the ball in there for a while, and and he was very close to to swimming right through the middle of a couple of those setups. So he'll be a really good uh, good sign, and I think on the the promise of that. And then Thomas was an interesting one because he did play very well, no doubt about that. I think depending on which site you look at, he's credited with somewhere between sort of twenty two and twenty eight tackles, and he's got two two three or four turnovers. Uh, just to sort of underline how difficult it is to put stats together. <laughs> um, but I just thought it was it was interesting just to see how different he is as a seven, actually, in, in terms of, uh, I said this on the, the rap pod I was on on Monday, the main one, in, uh, stepping in for Harley, but you know, I think Thomas Young, if he'd started that game, probably would have made 10 fewer tackles, somewhere around 15 or whatever, but would have attempted double the amount of jackals, whereas Thomas is not, He's not a consistent jackal threat. He's not going to go over every single breakdown and try and slow down. He'll if the ball's there and he fancies it, he'll he'll go straight in for the jackal. And he won two brilliantly on the floor. But yeah, it's not it's not a criticism or anything as such. It's just a an observation that I think they're going to have to, and this will come as they play the, the forwards play more together. They'll just have to uh, utilize the teamwork a bit more around Dan Thomas, James Botham, Liam Belcher, as a Dommer, these kind of guys. Uh, working as a, a team and hunting in packs around the turnover rather than just relying on when where we've had Ellis or where we've had uh, Thomas Young or Ollie Robinson over the last few years who just literally just go everything on the floor. Yeah, I 100% agree. I think that was quite evident in the first 15 minutes or so where Zebra had a lot of possession. They weren't going anywhere with it, which says a lot about the defence. The defence was really well drilled and didn't really give them much at all. I think there was one penalty, but uh, you know you allow that in first twenty minutes. But they, you know, in general, it was flat defence. You're not. You know, there was there were no obvious line breaks. There were no noticeable missed tackles. If I could be completely honest, um, but you're giving Zebra first game of the season near enough. 10 minutes of possession it felt like at times which i got to be honest i personally wouldn't want to see yeah. if, if you're at home if, if you're a defensive coach you know it's great great that you're keeping up on the line and you're just shuffling across doing the job you know as we said before on um on last week's party you know 
putting Lilo in there because he's just going to marshal and make sure that nothing breaks through. But you want to do something on your own ball and you want to create a bit of havoc. And I think I think there was a bit easy possession for Zebra and a bit easy defending for Cardiff. It seemed like two sides that were just like, right, we're going to do our jobs and just see it out and not do anything stupid um, for, for 10, 15 minutes rather than a kicking duel or... It was a different. It was a different way of sussing the opponents out. I thought um, on 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 the kicking duels as well. I thought Aled had a good start to the game, particularly at, at nine. I did think he played well, and then um, I know Mulder came on and made a couple of mistakes with kicks, but you know it, it, that happens, and he's he's going to learn from it. And you could see immediately what I did like about that. Was immediately, the beer was going over to him, being like, "Right, don't worry about it. You know, you're the next one probably an Afrikaans. I'm not going to try and do the accent, <laughs> but the, the like." You know, he's quickly just giving a word in, in his ear and giving him a bit of advice. And I thought that was quite nice. Um, what did happen then in the final 20? Because I, you know, I, I did, didn't watch it live. I took a recap because I was on walking on my way to the stadium after working on the Wales game. But the final 20, the wheels didn't come off, but it was just a bit of complacency. Yeah, and I thought it was an accumulation of how the game had gone to that point as well, because I, I, I agree that, you know, Ali Davis came in for a little bit of stick and responses to my tweets and stuff after the game. A couple of people, some somebody mentioned like the jury's out on him and stuff like that. And but I actually thought he kicked really well. Like I th- I went back and and sort of just tallied through the kicking because it was quite a kick heavy game from us. And we we box kicked to compete fifteen times in the game. Um, and there was obviously more than that as well. We kicked a touch a couple of times clear and uh, and he had one over the top sort of fifty twenty two ish, but. The, the obviously our, our main sort of attacking game plan on the night was to kick a lot in the middle third try and win the ball back inside their half or in some sort of unstructured play by flapping the ball back and then try and play either on the counter or on front football from there and of those 15 we there's two that zebra sort of bobble into touch and one where uh, Alan drops a little one over the top for you and Stevens to run on to, but he's, he's then immediately turned over on the floor because he's all by himself. So we didn't actually recover a kick, a box kick to compete in play once. You know, and, and if that's your main game plan, which it seemed to be, you're sort of struggling a bit. So I just thought the last 20 minutes, we've, we're at 200 odd tackles at that point. We've conceded somewhere around you know 60% possessions probably a bit more in territory hardly got out of our half legs are tiring a bit we've gone to the bench quite early as well a couple of uh, quite early subs and I think there was quite a lot of fatigue on there at that point we've brought Mulder and De Beer on who um uh, you know, Mulder. I felt I felt sorry for him a bit to be honest, because that you know the box kicking is not his game. If we, you know, we you watch him play for the Grickers and Curry Cup, and and Curry Cup's not a big box kicking environment anyway. You know, you're not box kicking to compete on a hard, fast track in South Africa. If you're kicking, you're battering the ball down as far as you can and saying good luck running that back, lad. So, um, <laughs> like, I, yeah, I felt a bit sorry for him. And then it was yeah, it was just tired legs, couldn't chase very well. The kicking quality dropped off a bit we lost uh we, we never really had that consistent threat over the ball so they were able to keep possession quite well I thought Zebra play quite differently from how we, we thought they were going to that usually we see them as expansive and play wide and make quite a lot of mistakes that way and, and cough the ball up they were quite happy to go one or two passes per phase and truck it up and hardly made a mistake because it's difficult to make mistakes when you're playing such risk-free rugby really so um yeah it was it was just an accumulation of, of... <laughs> that's a damning indictment isn't it? <laughs> it is i mean I, and i don't i don't i don't actually begrudge them that you know they've got rid of all their overseas players they're about 18 like 18 20, uh, italian teenagers running around the pitch and and the best way to get them to play is literally just keep the ball and try and see what you can do from there but it was. Um, it was... was very much sort of Arsene Wenger against Stoke. That to me, yeah. <laughs> like you know, they weren't even trying to do dangerous play. It was. Um... It was. It was just like it was just quite. I mean, there's a reason we made 250 odd tackles because every phase was just one pass tackle, one pass tackle. So, um, yeah, that, that and I, we dug in, but the, the, I think the concern is is that better teams in Zebra will come to the Arms Park this season. And if we give them 60% possession and 65% territory and don't fire a shot and they are a bit, have a bit more of a developed attacking game, 
then they will score quite a lot of points against us if we play like that again. So, yeah, the, the last 20 was a little, little bit of nervousness on our part, a little bit of legs gone, a little bit of... Uh, I, I felt the coaches should have changed it, really, with the halfbacks coming on. I think they should have sent Mulder and Beer on and said, look, lads, we've hardly had the ball in the second half. Just in that middle third of the pitch, we're not going to kick immediately. Let's play five to ten phases first. Nothing major doesn't have to be does it we can just do whatever we're doing and, and take one or two phases at a time you know go into contact don't work anyone too hard drop it back to the 10 and where we're playing into the wind a low flat tina's to be a kick pin them back as far as they can and say look if you're going to continue to keep the ball you're going to have to do it from your own 22 rather than we're giving it to you on halfway line every time but yeah i think that's learning for for the players and the coaches in that situation um so the good, I think the good thing is we've done it on a good weekend where the other team haven't punished us. Um, and from that point then, you know, we can we can only improve those last few minutes of the game, especially where, you know, some of our more experienced guys are coming back still and we can uh, pack the bench a bit with them. And, you know, if, if Bevan's fit this weekend, you might not see Mulder, for example. Then you've got Davis coming off the bench who would be a bit better in those situations with his kicking accuracy. So, not... Not too concerned at this point, but it was it was a touch and go at uh, a little bit in that last five minutes on Friday, where you're sort of looking at the clock and thinking, right, if they score now, they will get the ball back to score again, which isn't where you want to be against them, really. I did think it was slightly um, almost as if they were still in preseason mode a little bit of the, you know, the, you know, just do the you, you plan you plan your defense and you plan what patterns you're going to do and what you're going to do whether you're going to drift where you're going to blitz and then drift whether you're going to uh, how many players you're going to put in the tackle it seemed very much like okay follow the plan just do as we're told and then that the, it didn't seem to be much of um I, and, and there's a lot to be said about that you know it's early in the season and building up fitness and building up just repetition and building up a reputation of perhaps being a different disciplined defence and not giving away stupid penalties in rucks might be helpful long long time on the road. You know, referees are human, as we're continuously told, and they do follow patterns of play. Um, and I think, I think, I, as, as you said, first and foremost, it was a win is a win. And I think after last season, especially, um, Cardiff fans have to take it and just go, right, that's fine, park it and look to next week and hopefully improve on last season because yes next week is Scarlet away and um, obviously they did the double over Cardiff somehow last season um, but yeah it, uh, Scarlet themselves had a rather impressive performance out in bed well impressive second half performance uh, the last 10 minutes of the first half I thought this could be 50 points because they you know players were falling off tackles players were walking back into defence and then all of a sudden, second half, they really kicked into gear and were perhaps unlucky to end up with only a draw out in Treviso. Yeah, uh, the, the Scarlet's performance was and was impressive generally, you know, the way they clung in and, and got a draw out there, a place where not many teams will go and get points this season. Um, played them on a nice weekend as well, where they were missing quite a few Italians, but Scarlet's got a decent injury list of their own. I think the whole weekend, though, watching, I watched quite a few of the games over the weekend, uh, English Prem and URC, and I think the way that the season is set up now with so few preseason games and so many players to give minutes to, that preseason field does stretch into that first week of games because if you're, you know, ideally, if you're a coach, you're probably thinking, I'd want maybe like four preseason games here to give everybody somewhere around 100, 150 minutes each. But the risk of injury is so great, especially at a time when squads are so small and, um, you know, the, there's not the money there to go out and get medical jokers or whatever that you you can't take that risk so two preseason games is not enough to get you up to speed for round one and uh, watched Osprey's Dragons on Saturday which was an interesting game like tactically but it was it didn't look anything like a Welsh derby there was like no sort of intensity or spite or anything to that it was you know it, it may as well have just been two guys having two teams having a bit of a training hit out at, at some points because there was yeah it's just everybody's just trying to sort of muddle through round one into round two and then uh, like get in week to week and, and settle into the season from there. So, um, but that that's, that's where the fixture list has advantage Cardiff with the the games that we've got and the amount of home games and playing Zebra first up as well, that we can settle into the season a little bit more and, uh, and 
with so many new faces, you know, that that's the thing is that there was eight debutants in that 15 and a few more off the bench where you're looking for players to come on, uh, experienced players potentially to come on and, and maybe change things on the field. That's going to take time for them as well. You know, if you're just thinking your, your normal work in life, you don't just walk into a new job into the office first day and say, right guys, this is what we're going to do. You know, you, 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 it takes a couple of games and getting to know uh, personalities and and then you can start you can see your experienced players start to affect change on the pitch and that's the same for the coaches as well who are settling in so yeah it is it is very much uh, a performance that yeah sort of pre-season and a half maybe for Cardiff you might say and um, but it will have to improve big time this Saturday because the Scarlets will be bouncing off getting a, a draw out in Benetton first game back at home for them imagine they'll look to get a decent crowd in and uh, yeah, it, it'll have to be a big uplift if we're going to take something away from Clenetti on Saturday. Yeah, a um, couple of the people haven't seen the game, a couple of the players played particularly well. Really nice try from Max Page, who I think everyone has, you know, if you don't know the name, where have you been? Is <laughs> starting to get that sort of element, isn't it, for Max? Because obviously uh, tries, he's got a hat-trick in the semi-final of the Welsh Prem last season and um He's obviously been on fire um, for the Wales under twenty. He's got a hat trick for them in the summer as well. So he's one to look out for for the future. He's got a very good try against Benetton, and uh, despite a late back line shuff- reshuffle, which saw one of the one of my favourite swaps in history of Johan Line at twelve swap for John Lee Williams at twelve, <laughs> which I do think is like basically going. This is the game plan, right? Just completely get rid of it. <laughs> because there's absolutely no point. You've got to, you know, go you and line at 12 next to Costi, and then you go, I'll tell you what, boys, Costi's not feeling well. You're going to have to shift you on at 10 and bring, oh, who, who have we got the similar to you on line at 12? <laughs> Johnny Williams. <laughs> you know, I just really like that idea that um, <laughs> 24 hours before kickoff, Dwayne Field goes, yeah, that there's no point in all the prep we've done this week, this month for this game. Um, but yeah, uh, the good performance from them all the same. Uh, a couple of others to look out for. Van der Merwe was pretty pretty good in the front row for debut. Um, uh, they were oh the wings particularly um, look very good. And they box kicked well and they retained ball well in the air, which uh, that was that would be an area which I think Scarlett's a look to put pressure on Cardiff was uh, the aerial battle because both wings look good, particularly Blair Murray. Um, he was very safe under the high ball um, from box kicks and. Um, yeah, Gareth Davis kicking to compete as well. So, um, yeah, things do happen. Um, <laughs> pigs can't fly. No, I'm joking. Um, but where, where do you think Cardiff can get the upper hand then against Scarlet on Saturday? It's, it's a tough one, uh, really, because looking at the Scarlet and Scarlet are always quite evenly matched. You know, they're the two Welsh sides that probably play the most similar or look to, to play in the, the most uh, similar way through the back, certainly. I think. Our kicking's got to be better to to properly test them. Um, I, I didn't. I thought they were they were solid, but I didn't. Benetton didn't massively target them. Uh, I think once they lost a few in the air, they sort of went, "Well, we're not doing that anymore," and we're, <laughs> we're just binning off. Though, uh, just try to keep the ball in hand and play a lot more. I think if we can put some real pressure on their defense, I think we can test them in, in that midfield. You know, Page, if he does play again at thirteen, great talent, but. You know, you've got to. If you're seeing a guy literally just stepping into senior professional rugby at outside centre, you've got to think right. That's where we're going to go. I'm mean, sure we'll get onto team selection a bit later. But if you're if you're looking at a Cardiff backline and think, do do I send Mason Grady just straight at Page early doors and see what happens? You know, that's something that you could consider. Um, and then I think I think it's speed of ball a little bit as well. The, the Benetton were quite physical. They were quite direct. Um, they did move the ball wide when it was on, but the, the Scarlets with Jared Taylor at seven, um, they are lacking. Really he was, but he, he's not an open side as no. well. He's, he's, he was very physical and met Benetton's straight up uh, sort of direct play. Got through a lot of work that way, but they they will cons- like similar to how Cardiff didn't have the jackal throw on Friday. They they were they won't turn the ball over regularly, and most of their turnovers were coming from Benetton handling errors. So um, we can if we can get the tempo up and move them around because they, they are quite a big pack. I think Fafita picked up an injury as well potentially on Saturday. So if he's not available, then that is a, a plus for us. Uh, Lousy may be back, but. 
you know, if you can stretch him, he can give you a yellow card because he can get out of shape, tackle technique wise. So, um, what technique? <laughs> no, I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> um, but yeah, I th- I think that's where we're gonna have to we're gonna have to be a bit braver in that middle third and play a little bit more. Um, we're gonna have to hope like bring our tempo, and I think we'll have to bring a ball carrier into that our back row. I think as well, Donal went well and, and both them you know they both got through a lot of individual work but it, it reminded me of when we used to play Josh Turnbull at eight in that you know he'll he'll do a good job he'll always give you seven or eight out of ten but ultimately against Zebra we didn't have a primary ball carrier going into the sort of contact there the guy the go-to guy like a big Mac like Alan Lawrence who I thought looked good when he came on again unfortunately he had to go off but um mm-hmm. like uh, you know, when, when guys we've used over the years, Big Nick and Navidi and stuff, you, you do need a go-to guy that just occasionally you say, right, get us over the, the game line and we'll go from there. And so if we're going to be a bit brave with ball in hand, we will need that. Um, but yeah, it's it's tempo tempo and uh, and being able to retain possession for longer periods of time is where we're going to get it. Because ultimately, I don't think you can go into the Scarlets and, and play like rear guard rugby and, and hope that you nick something from there because... They do have players that will just score points, so you you it's difficult to match them in that sense. You do have to go and score a couple of tries, and and we've seen that when we go down there and win. You know, generally, if we are winning, we're bonus point winning because we've had to score a lot of tries to stay ahead of them. Yeah, um, the other one to a target is maybe Ellis me around fifty to sixty minutes because I don't think I've ever seen a guy cramp as much yeah. in my life. <laughs> he cramped about three times in between fifty and sixty minutes. Which bless him, obviously, first game of URC rugby he was probably probably finding it a bit bit, bit quick quicker perhaps of pace and things like that than he'd played before. And the guy was down, down and up, down and up, down and up, <laughs> trying to defend. But yeah, not what you want is your blind side <laughs> wing trying to trying to defend and also. Um, stretch out his hamstring or calf. I think it was his calf in the end. Um, but yeah, as, as I said, yeah, spot on on Jared Taylor. I thought I thought he was superb, but he is one that is you know so he was a big back row that they played with Plumtree yeah, and yeah, huge and Fafita and, and and all three are athletes in their own way. But you don't have that poacher there. You don't have that uh, Jackling Nouse is perhaps the the, the Marty Holler Nouse or the as you mentioned, the Alice Jenkins now, some Martin Williams now, to, to just sniff a turnover where it's on. Um, I think I think they they looked, I must say, I, I was impressed with Scarlet. I thought they'd struggle out there, but they they did impress me. I think what will be interesting next week is whether you and Lloyd plays at 12 again. Um, but as in, is, that was the plan last week, whether it happens again this week, because um, that is a small centre partnership. Yeah. Between Lloyd and Page, it really is. Um, very talented pairing, both brilliant ball players and footballers, as you want to call, if you want to call them that. But they are they are both on the smaller side. Max Page runs his weight, but he isn't he isn't one who's probably going to dominate a defensive line or a, a gain line or anything like that. So. That's an area that, as you mentioned, coming to selection that perhaps uh, Cardiff could target. Um, do you want to do selection now, or do you want to wait till the end? Or I'll do it. Yeah, yeah, go on. Yeah, yeah. Because I suppose any changes in the back three? Because that's that's probably the the first question. And I think you've hinted at Grady move to thirteen, and I'd be tempted to say as well. Yeah, that I mean that would be the change. But I I mean Win it is at fullback still. I don't think Beatham's fit yet anyway, but, but I'd see no reason to pull Win out to there. Stevens was excellent, so he retains his spot on the left wing. And then yeah, I think the thing about the Scarlet centre pairship and how we set up it is that they, they do have quite a lot of very different options there. Like we said about Lloyd and Williams coming in. There's a whisper that Eddie James might be fit again this weekend. So they yeah they could I they got Williams and James both big blokes and then you've got Lloyd and Page both small blokes, you could mix and match you can go to the two extremes so it'll be difficult it, that you know that's an advantage they do have the Cardiff won't know exactly what's coming through that midfield but I think Lilo did a good job on Friday but he he looked like his legs had gone a little bit by sort of 60, 65 minutes. I think we probably changed Millard for Stevens too early um, and it left us a little bit exposed there. So I'd be tempted with Ray being somewhere around 65 or 70, I think. <laughs> um, that I'd be tempted to say, give Ray a week off this week, 
give Grady a go in a big Welsh derby at 13 where, you know, he said, uh, he's, he, he'll say he's happy to play wherever and I'm sure in the media, but ultimately he must fancy playing at 13 more regularly and the Welsh coaches will want to see him playing at 13 as well. So, yeah, I think I'd go Grady into the centre and then Gabe would be my choice then come on to the right wing, I think, just to keep that size and that speed of chasing up and down. I think if you bring Millard in, Millard, Winnett and Stevens is is quite a small back three and it's quite similar as well. I think Gabe just adds a little bit of uh, something a bit different there. Yeah, I completely agree. I, I I wanted to see Gabe last week. Um, uh, hopefully he's fit and raring to go to, to start this week. Um, and then I think everyone knows Ben Thomas is going to start as well. That's yeah. not going to... Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, think, I think that's one you could ink in for the whole season. Um, 10, would you change the halfbacks at all? Because I'd be... The, the, you know, obviously, Bevan, as you mentioned, is is the one debate if he's coming back from fitness. But um, I, I, I'd start Sheedy, surely. And then yeah. you, you probably... Either Aled or Bevan, and you you're not losing much there. Yeah, a hundred percent Sheedy. Um, and then I think it'll obviously depend on it, exactly how fit Bevan is. I, I think it was a broken finger, so sort of like general fitness wise, he should be fine. But obviously, it's just like how how healed the finger is in terms of gripping and and right, like passing for however long. But I Boy think Keen's entered the podcast. Yeah, like... yeah. <laughs> um, uh, my. I'd be happy with either. I don't think there's much in it particularly. I think my my sl- like slight preference on a fifty one forty nine basis would probably be Bevan, um, but I think then Jockey will probably do Davis um, and just stick with those two for now and bring Bevan onto the bench. But I think I think that's a little bit because Bevan offers slightly more in terms of uh, you know sniping threat, big physical guy. He can lift that tempo a bit, but also then because. I think Alid is probably the better of the two to bring off the bench if you're controlling things. Yeah, it, it depends how positive or negative you want to be, really. Because if you if you say that Alid keeps it tight maybe for sixty minutes and kicks well, and then Bevan comes on to play, or does does Bev? Do you hope that Bevan's got us into a winning position and then Alid comes on to see it out? But yeah, I think I think I'd lean towards Bevan, but I'm i yeah not I, I'm not going to throw my toys out of the pram if it was Davis. <laughs> Yeah, I think I, purely from a probably journalistic slash neutral standpoint, you kind of want to see Bevan start to see that battle against Gareth. Yeah, um, Gareth Davis uh, in the nines. Um, not saying Alan Davis is out of the question, particularly now he's back in Wales. But it, it's 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 you know, the starting nine versus the old head at nine, perhaps. Yeah, and I think that's that's an interesting battle always. Um, front row, I think probably Dom is the one question mark if he's if he's you know, available, do you start bringing back into the front row? Yeah, my, my assumption was that we've probably kept him back for week two. There was no mention of an injury um, uh, for him last week. I, I don't, he wasn't a travelling reserve, but I wouldn't necessarily expect him to do that either. If you're happy that both the loose heads are fit, uh, you know, they, they would, I think it was, um, uh, who was the, the well? I can't actually remember who the loose head traveling reserve was off the top of my head now because Barrett was with the rags, but I'm, I'm 99% sure it wasn't Dahmer. Um, but yeah, I think if he's fit, I'd bring him in. Um, it's a, a good battle there then against Wainwright, who you know, the Scarlet's front row were a lot, I thought they looked a lot improved last week. Um, Matthias, who has come in for stick at times, I think because probably he's been rushed into the Wales squad um, where we've either had a few injuries or Gatland is just refusing to pick certain people. Um, so he's had a bit of stick from, from that in the same way that the, you know, Carey did and Dylan Lewis did as well, where they've come in very young and, but Matthias looked like he was justifying the sort of talent ceiling that some have put up in last week and Wainwright, um, or slightly being, always slightly been an odd, player for, um doesn't look like a rugby player really as not should be a lot more dominant than than he it seems, it seems like he should be a lot more dominant for a guy of his size but held up a, a good benetton pack last week so yeah I'd, I'd be tempted to to run the front row it probably um i the only question mark in my head is is maybe gives evan lloyd a go from the start potentially and has belcher off the bench um just to add x obviously evan is a big old bloke uh just to add extra size again bit of extra ball carrying as well uh, i think his line out throwing was all right when he came on uh on friday night so um but 
yeah, I think if I was writing the team down, it would be Ron the front row. Yeah, I, I'm similar on Evan. Um, and the reason I was laughing at Wayne, right, is I thought he played very well, apart from his absolute <laughs> brain fart. Yeah, that decided, was awful. <laughs> right, I just genuinely, I have no other words for it. Like, lovely guy, played well, but you, you just... Why are you charging down a penalty? Just to <laughs> I've got no, I've got no understanding of that whatsoever. And charging it down, and then sort of looking half surprised when the referee penalises you then oh, as well. No. <laughs> oh, I thought it was a conversion. How? How did you think it was a conversion? You weren't by your post. What? Should have gone for a HIA straight away at that point. <laughs> yeah. Oh, really? not the funniest HIA of the weekend either. That would have been um, Ruben Morgan, Morgan Williams. Yeah. Was that? For uh, HIA, while his mouth guard was in his socks, but moving on, um, I think yeah, I, I'd be tempted by Evan, but coming back to that over the ball threat, I think it'd be good to have Belcher because I think he's probably at this stage. I'm not saying Evan couldn't develop that a bit more, particularly he's got a back row background, um, but I think um, yeah, at the moment I think Belcher's stronger over the ball and can jackal better. I think it, slowing down Scarlett's ball is always important. Um, they're always a side that can play well if you give them front football. Um, second rows, I see no reason to change. Unless... Oh, yeah, no, I don't either. I think exactly the same with McNally, then Teddy, then Rory on the bench. I think it'd be pretty much exactly the same. And then back row, you mentioned a change at eight, perhaps. Um, does that mean Donald to six and and uh, Lawrence to eight? Or well, Big Mac to eight? What were you thinking? I, th- my, I think Big Mac... Uh, was missed out for sort of non rugby reasons last week, which are now resolved. And uh, I think he will start if he's available. I think they'll say, look, you know, you've had a week off there. We're going to stick you straight in and, and give you a go from the start this week. Um, the, the, I I think Donald might be the player to make way because I think they'll want both of them at six then with Thomas, but um, and then probably. Probably Donald goes on to the bench then. Um, it's a slight risk. Zal- Allen is a very good bench option still. Um, and if Big Mac's not around, then I'd, ha- I'd happily see Allen start. But it's obviously tough with Cardiff because we've got so many good back row options. But I just, I don't, I don't see a situation where Botham doesn't start. Um, I, I think if he's fit, you start him. Doesn't really matter what jersey he wears. And then I would, yeah, I just, I would just like us to have a better carrying option than from eight um, or six, whichever one Mac or or, Don, uh, or Lawrence drops into. But yeah, so both both them Thomas Mac with Donald on the bench, I think is what I go for, which is harsh on Allen. Um, but I just think that's probably the way to give us the best uh, carrying options and then the best impact from the bench covering a few positions as well. Would you be tempted to put Donald and would you even pretend to do a six two, or would you be tempted to put Donald instead of Thornton on the bench? I, I kind of agree with the start. You know, Dan Thomas, we're, we're both assuming is going to be in the start yeah. line because he's in front of press this week. Yes, <laughs> you know that old uh, chestnut, that old uh, giveaway. But the um, I think. I uh, I I'd love to see Alan Lawrence be, be in the squad. I just think the last five or six appearances in particular, he's been superb whenever he's played. So um, going back to last season and um, performances out out in South Africa as well, he was brilliant. So I think I think he'd be one that would be very unfortunate to miss out if he did. Yeah, it is. And six two is. I, I'm not I'm not immediately tempted by a 6-2 away at Scarlet's because I think the weather's looking all right for Saturday. I think it will be quite a fast-paced game. And I, I worry that if we went 6-2, we'd pay for it in the last sort of 15 minutes if we had some quite tired legs in the backs. Um, where the Scarlet's, if they went 5-3 and, you know, if Eddie James is back and Costello's back from feeling unwell, then... They can bring, you know, if they could bring Johan Lloyd on or they can bring, you know, potentially, I don't know if they push Max Page to the wing and then have Ellis Mee coming on or whatever the, the way they go. They can bring some some real pace and some uh, some real quality off the bench in their backs then. So yeah, as much as I would, as much as I concede the argument for 6-2, I think that the potential downside to it probably just prevents me from doing that this week. Um, yeah, I, th- I think... 
and then uh, I'm not. I think Thornton off the bench is just very good for set piece in that final twenty minutes. Then as well, you know, it. it I think if you, he doesn't offer the sort of eighty minute physicality that you sometimes need in these big games. But I think if you can say to him, look, Rory, twenty minutes, go and smash as many rucks as you can and make as many tackles as you can and secure us all the line out ball, then I think that's a pretty good option to bring off the bench. So, yeah, I, I think it is just a harsh one on, on Lawrence in my mind, um, potentially this week. And then the following week, you know, Big Mac's not going to play every week. Uh, Thomas and, and both of them will have both played a lot of rugby by then. Against Glasgow, we'll want some more physical guys against quite a big pack. So, you might bring him back in for that, but yeah, that yeah, I, I that, there's a lot of ways Cardiff could go with this, and there's not really any bad options. But I think the Thornton, Donnell, and five three would be the way I would go. Yeah, um, I, I'm happy to agree. Then um, moving to the bench, then you go to uh, obviously Evan Lloyd. I, we mentioned there as a possible starter, so we put him on straight to the bench. Yeah. Uh, Edburn or uh, Southworth, one word? Probably Burn for this one. Um, yeah. It's Burn and Hilton. Sorry, sorry. You said, you said one word, and I was thinking about you saying one word as I was saying more words. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Reese Litterick, I think, is the, the obvious other option. A tight head um, and with Thornton, then and Donald. Um, it'll be then Aled on the bench uh, with De Beer and Millard. Yeah. I think I think Millard is probably the only other outside back we've got fit now <laughs> at the moment as well because we've got quite a lot of injuries there at the moment. So uh, yeah, ah, Lilo, obviously, yeah, yes, that's I, I'm never a massive fan of bringing Lilo off the bench. I don't think he, I don't think it suits him at all to be honest. So uh, I, I think if if you're not if he's not starting, you're just leaving him at home. Really. So, uh, or but the other thing I'd like to see them doing a little bit with Lilo this season is is bringing him. Um, you know, water boy in and getting him wired up to the coaches and seeing if that's a transition he might fancy as well. I don't I don't know if coaching is necessarily exactly what he wants to do, but I think there's there's some role there as a sort of player mentor type thing for him and, and getting him involved in the sort of getting messages on and just having a quiet word in people's ears is not a bad thing at all. Yeah, I'll I'll quickly run through that then. So it was uh, I'm probably going to get this wrong, but Domchowski, um, Belcher and Azarati front row, McNally and Teddy Williams, both of them, Dan Thomas, uh, Big Mac, um, 9 and 10 then, uh, Bevan and Callum Sheedy, Ben Thomas, Grady, uh, Iwan Stevens, Game Paper Webb and um, Cam Winnett. It's hard, it's hard to even think to recap 15 <laughs> when you haven't written them down and sensibly. Um, but yeah, it, it, it should be a good game on Saturday and that's at 5.30 as part of a big double header. Before I talk about the other games, obviously the uh, the Rags games, um, just a reminder to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, I think we're on close to 500 subscribers now. Um which I think so we're yeah, doing quite well on there and uh, follow us on all social media on that's on Twitter and um, uh, I think Facebook as well are the two primary ones we are working on the Instagram and trying to grow that but we uh, are very slow at it um, but we will we will develop that a bit more in the future um, but yeah if you could have a look at our YouTube because we will put clips up of you know small sections of different pods and things like that as well so you can have a little taste of some of the other pods that are going on and Various other pods started up in the last couple of weeks, including a women's pod. Uh, what else? Is, what else has started up? A, a URC wide pod, isn't there? Is there's, there's yeah. all sorts now. Yeah, if you if you want if you want any sort of Welsh rugby or even general rugby related content, just subscribe to that YouTube channel, and it's all there in your feed. You can't go wrong, really. <laughs> Yeah, brilliant. That that was the advert, you know, <laughs> my ramblings. Um, let's talk about rags because, as I mentioned, six points for the rags, which, despite it being stupid, uh, everyone <laughs> will take it and run with it. Um, it was a very good performance as well. That's that's the you know there was one blemish on the card, and we'll talk about that further on um, in terms of injuries, which was very sad to see. But um, but overall, what a performance from the rags. Yeah, generally quite a tight game against Ebu Vale that we, we do sort of come out on top of usually. But, I mean, it was pretty dominant at times on, on Thursday night there. There was uh, a, a couple of changes, a couple more new faces coming in, a couple of new combinations. But uh, against uh, an Ebu Vale team that, you know, is always well drilled, is strong up front, um, can pin you back and, and really make it difficult for you. 
we played some really nice stuff a lot of good attacking rugby really solid up front uh, probably could have won it a bit more comfortable in the end there was you know Ebervale were were pushing at times in the second half but yeah they kind of soaked up a lot of that pressure brilliant on transition so the counter-attacking try in particular uh, where Tom Rice number eight goes across the field and uh feeds Josh Thomas and, and Derry Cross on that left-hand side um, was really good. Obviously, a couple of young guys through midfield, Steph Emmanuel making his debut and maybe in another slight pre-arranged man of the match of <laughs> won, won that one as well. I don't, um, but he, he definitely grew into the game. There was a couple in the first half where it was on to shift the ball and he, he sort of kept hold of it and went, and went through midfield a bit. And uh, where I stood on the on the south terrace, there was a very sh- frustrated Derry Cross on the left wing who was <laughs> who was wanting a lot more ball than he was getting in that first half before finally uh, finally getting oh, a, two. a try. Oh, damn. Yeah, well, yeah, was, <laughs> when he was running back, it was sort of like, yeah, we told you it was coming, <laughs> so we're like, yeah. but um, but yeah, uh, he played very well. Josh Thomas looked very good at, at fly half as well. Um, I thought Joe Goodchild as a player who doesn't start every week and is shifted around quite a bit from center to wing to full back, always produces a, a lot of high quality rugby. And he was at full back on Thursday, didn't put a foot wrong, really covered the ground brilliantly solid under the high ball. And then um, as a big bloke is, is uh, return carrying is, is so good. He can, he can beat a guy off a step or he can literally just plow through somebody really, if he wants to. So uh, no, a lot to like, um, I also think we had a hand in it by saying how good Evan Lloyd's kicking usually is and clearly have absolutely jinxed him, the Ebu Vale fly half rather than our hooker. Um, because uh, I, he was struggling to get to grips with that wind big time and they were shanking off all over the shop, which was unfortunate for him and Ebu Vale, but a, a win for the rags on the nights because uh, they struggled to sort of get a lot of territory and left a, a couple of points off the tee there then as well. But no, uh, I think if you're... Befries and Dan Fish, and you've got eleven points from twelve, and sitting joint top of the table. You 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 can't really ask for much more going into you know a weekend off uh, as well with a lot of extra time to prepare then for the coming games. Yeah, um, just just to recap on the score: twenty nine points to twelve. Cardiff won, therefore winning by fifteen, therefore getting the extra bonus point um, to, to finish on six points. Um, yeah, you mentioned the kicking. I think Evan Evan Lloyd hand, handed his kicking boots to the other Evan on the pitch, Evan <laughs> Daniel, because uh, Evan Daniels, I had that line lined up for about 15, <laughs> 20 seconds ago. Uh, Evan Daniel. Um, um, with a 50, well, I think it wasn't quite a 50 22 because I think the ball was taken into his own half, but you know, pretty much, pretty much there. Um, and yeah, as you mentioned, um, Steph Emmanuel did get him out of the match, but I did agree actually. I thought there were a couple of moments where there was a little bit of, I don't want to say selfishness because that sounds a bit harsh because it, it was probably more looking to to carry forward rather than rather than put the ball out. But I did think there were opportunities to put the ball wider. Um and but overall he did have a brilliant game and for what well, he's still so young. Like it is ridiculous to see. And it, it was is he still 18 or is he now 19? But 18, uh, 19 year old yeah, kids dominate dominate in the way that he was up against a pretty decent centre partnership in Ethan Phillips and Cameron Davis. So um, really good performance from the Rags um, and yeah it probably surprised a few it's definitely surprised me the way they've started considering turnover of players you know no uh, no big Morgan Allen you know he was turning out for for um, uh, who's he Pontypool now is yeah in right? the second the second row they're playing him as well yeah so he's, he's turning out in the second row for Pontypool and yes there are still Big name players, Craig Hurd, Sean Moore, um, and I thought the front row were very good with Will Davis King and Reese Barrett either side of Evan Daniel. But it's it's a younger side if you look through. Josh Thomas will be a really good player um, for them. I think he was brilliant on the night. Uh, the one question I don't know what their plan is with Harry Wild around that. Obviously Harry's injured at the moment, but it'll be interesting to see how those two sort of coexist, I suppose, in the same team because. Josh has the experience and probably has the um, has the uh, has the talent too, but has the ability at the moment. Whereas Harry's is still a work on as a young under twenties fly half. Yeah, and, and in fairness to to Griff uh, in particular, uh, director of rugby there with the academy stuff, but he's, he is very good at managing everybody's game time. And there's been a lot of good quality semi professionals who've just come out of the professional game who 
uh, there and you you might look at that maybe you look at like uh, you know Tom Haberfield when Ellis Bevan was coming through and Jamie Hill were there um, there's been you know sort of Aaron Pinches and then when Mason Grady's been coming through at the same time and in that uh, cup win inside, you know, there was a lot of, of good experienced guys through in the outside uh, uh, back positions, but you still got plenty of Max Llewellyn and, and Ben Thomas playing. Um, so I think, I think it'll just be on a sort of every other basis. Wild, um, obviously a talented guy, but I think he's back with the twenties this year. Pretty sure he's still there and has had injuries. Like you said, you know, he's, he's been injured for quite a bit last season. So I think they'll manage him closely. And then the other thing I think they can do is we might see a bit of Thomas at 15 as well, just, uh, just talking through a uh, while through a few games, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me that, you know, if, if there was a, a slight injury picked up by uh, Sheedy or Debia that we saw, I think, well, Thomas has um, trained full time with the first team through the summer. I don't know whether he still is in full time with them, but it wouldn't surprise me if he was if that if that was to happen that they found a bit of money down the back of the sofa and signed him up to a short term deal um, to step into to that squad. So uh, yeah, they're, they're, they'll manage it pretty well. But um, overall, I, what we mentioned about the front row there with Barra, Daniel, and Davis King. I think that was particularly pleasing to see because there are times where guys drop down from the first team, and especially somebody like Evan Daniel who. You know, his last couple of games were on a Wales tour uh, to Australia. And now he's back playing Thursday nights against Ebu Vale. You you wouldn't even begrudge him necessarily for going, well, I can't be bothered with this particularly. And just sort of trotting around for 50 odd minutes and then coming off. But all action stuff from him, some great turnovers, physical in defence. Line out went really well considering, you know, he's probably not trained a huge amount with Rags. He'll have mostly been in with the first team, not doing much many Tuesday and Thursday nights over the summer. Um and yeah, the kick was was just the icing on top, really, just just for a laugh as well. So, yeah, it was great to see those guys taking the rag seriously and taking Super Rugby Cymru seriously and using it as you know proper game time and a chance to catch the eye of the of uh, jockey and co. Because that's the other thing Cardiff have been good at is making sure that the the first team coaches are there and aware of what's happening with the rags. And obviously Griff is is there as well and. Um, as that link and it does it does count for something when it comes to ongoing selection yeah of some some reason in my brain I feel if a player's playing well Griff will make 100% sure Jockey knows that they're playing well <laughs> I can imagine that straight away he's like did you see his performance this weekend did you see it? like yeah. in a good way I mean that in every good way in the sense of it's very passionate about these young lads coming through and performing well um, I mentioned well you've mentioned injuries there and I mentioned the one blemish and it's it's, it's it's really sad that um, William Bradley went off with a serious injury, which I think is a dislocated shoulder. Um, like the guy's been so unlucky with injuries in the last two years. Um, him and I was talking to, well, I was on the Welsh language pod with uh, Jesse Griffiths at the time, and we were we were look, we were watching the game and we saw it happen. And we both went, "Oh no, not again!" Like it, Will Griffiths is another one at Ospreys who seems to be getting these really long term injuries and. It's really sad for a guy who's got so much potential and started the game really well as well, by the way. Um, part of an exciting back row for Cardiff. So, um, yeah, speed recovery from that one because from personal experience, it's, it's horrific. I don't know if you've had the the joys, but it is is a horrific injury. Um, lucky he was on the gas and air, whereas I had to wait <laughs> two hours to start on it. So anyway, <laughs> not saying not saying professional rugby players have got it easier, but. Uh, <laughs> Um, speaking of, um, well, not speaking of me playing, but speaking of Glantav, because that's where I did my injury, uh, they also played on Thursday night. Um, just a quick note for them because they, they were brilliant. Um, I was able to view on Esperorek de Guidol and uh, on their YouTube channels and Facebook and, and and so. And one player stood out massively, which was Joseph Jones on the wing. Both of us were highly impressed. Um, his interception. Uh, in particular, as part of a hat trick in their win over Colega Kamai, they it was a really impressive performance by the whole team. But he, in particular, was one that stood out for you, and you said he he's one that you're looking out for possibly later down the line for Cardiff. Yeah, I, um, so yeah, he, he scored a couple of stunners last season as well when he was in lower sixth, and um, he he's already featured in preseason for the Rags. Um, I think he was off the bench against Pontypridd Apasardis. 
uh, he, I, I suspect the plan will be that he plays for Blantav and for Cardiff under 18, maybe as a sniff for uh, a Wales under 20 squad, potentially, um, when the Six Nations comes around. But then once all that's out of the way and come March time, you know, the college league's done and uh, an age grade rugby is done. I wouldn't be surprised at all to see him in and around a few rag squads towards the back end of the season if he's fit and if there's a spot for him there. You know, uh, Griff and, and Fisher have been very good at exposing some of these lads straight out of 18s uh, in the back end of the season. We saw like Evan Reese played quite a lot last season. Um, so, yeah, it wouldn't surprise me at all if if the likes of, of Jones in particular on the wing, but we saw uh, Lloyd Lucas was very good at uh, a 10 as well, he was captain in Glantarf this year. And it was my first time seeing Tom Howe in the flesh as well, a hooker. Big boy. And I think he's still in lower sixth as well because he was playing up. He should have been under 16 last year, but he was at under 18. But Christ, that's a physical bloke if he's only like seven, 16, 17 years old. Yeah. So... Um, yeah, they, they, they've obviously spoken about him quite a lot. I think there was a piece on Wales Online recently about him as well as being identified as somebody coming from the back row to hook up earlier than we usually do see them. It's usually around sort of 18, 19, you get that switch. So, um, yeah, to see him. And then just uh, just on the Camoy team as well, uh, there was a one of the Junior Academy lads, Dylan Barrett, brother of Reese. Um, the, there was definitely a family resemblance there because I walked into the Arms Park, I missed the, the first couple of minutes, looked onto the pitch, and I thought, oh, Reese Barrett's playing for Colin Camoy. <laughs> <laughs> as he looks exactly the same and moves exactly the same as him as well. So, uh, no, it was a great win for Glantaf. They were very good. Camoy were better than they were last season. They were quite disappointing last season. Um, and they're obviously not the powerhouse that they were sort of five, six years ago. But yeah, it was it was good to see them improving. And I think it'll be an exciting season for the Cardiff sides in that college league. And hopefully that feeds into Cardiff under 18 squad then as well. Yeah, uh, I'm going to go full bias. I hope we glance happy to the final. But that's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's all I'm going to say. Um, I, in terms of then other rugby news, the other big game from the week was Wales women. And if you want a full recap of that, Please check out, uh, I think Carly's involved in the the, the women's pod uh, that rap do. So please check that out. But um, that was also on Friday night. I was working on it. And yeah, it, OK, it wasn't the best Australian side. But when you haven't beaten the team in six attempts and you finally get over the line, who cares? <laughs> like, who cares how you do it, when you do it? You know, we saw when Georgia beat Wales in the Principality Stadium, they weren't looking at it going, why on earth is Reese Priestley kicking off first phase? They were going, you know, what a win for us. It was it was a brilliant performance from um from the from the girls, particularly I thought back row and some of the perhaps um less flaunted names. You know, you think of your Kate Williams's, your Bryony Kings, I thought they really stepped up in the absence of the likes of Alex Callender with uh, Alicia Butcher's on the bench. I thought they, those two were both brilliant um, in the backs as well. I thought Shaky had a really good performance, generally march, marshalling the troops very well. And Kira obviously doing what Kira Ben does in sniping and scoring tries and starting, drop, starting conversions and, you know, doing whatever needs to be done to win the game. I think the, the, the one area for me of concern moving forward is that strength of the scrum doesn't seem to be where it used to be the mall still is there but quite a few of the scrums were struggling a little bit against Australia and, and that's a bit you know considering how dominant Wales of Wales of scrum has been in the past um granted they had to be, do a quick rearrange with uh, uh Rosie Carr going up injured and sadly she is out of WXV2 with Molly Reardon coming into the hooker early on in that game but they were there were a couple of scrums which went backwards and hopefully that's something that they can work on to, to re-establish that dominance because despite wanting to expand their game, you want to start from a solid platform, don't you? And um, but yeah, overall it's, it's brilliant obviously to go into WXV two and face Australia in three or four days' time after meeting them, isn't it? As I, I suppose the question is, as obviously I didn't watch the game, so I can't comment on the on Friday's one, but how similar is that Australia team to the one we're likely to see on Saturday? And and how much does it actually matter in terms of Saturday's game beating them last week? Yeah. I, first question, I think there are going to be some changes. Well, from both sides, you know, Alex Callender is bound to come back in. Hannah Jones is bound to come back in. Um, I think uh, there might be a couple of changes in the back three. I don't know. I don't know if it was Nell Metcalf on one wing on the weekend, again, an opportunity. And she's been a bit in and out of the team recently, especially with, 
Karis being at 13, you probably think Karis Cox will shift to the wing to accommodate Hannah. Um, but yeah, in at times Australia were good. I think particularly second half, they they had a lot more control with uh, the substitute 10, whose name has sadly escaped me, and I will look it up, uh, coming off the bench, and she performed much better. So whether or not they make that change, and look, let's be frank about it, they they know the big game is next week. Both sides know the big game is next week, and Australia has probably been a bit of an eye opener for them, where they've come up to the North Hemisphere for the first time and lost heavily in Ireland and lost to Wales. So they will take a lot of learnings from this. Um, I think, I think it's going to be a much stronger Australia side next week, and they'll do very well to win. Um, is my personal assessment. Um, I. Don't uh, even though Australia are going through a bit of a um, uh, transitional phase for a of a terrible phrase, they they will be much better in a week's time I think than they were this week because there's there's enough talent there. You look at players like Masters playing in the back row. You know, she, uh, yes, she had a brilliant effort um, for a try. That I think it was disallowed, but she's one hell of a talent. Like someone who can play at hooker and seven. Um, and then you've got that back three, which are hugely, hugely talented. Um, holes at full back, I think she was 18. Um, so, you know, she's she stepping people in a phone box at 18. And if you think about that, making that impression in, in senior international rugby is pretty good to go um, to go up against a strong wheel side. Um, it'd be interesting to see what both sides do next week, whether how many people they change. But um, congratulations, massive congratulations as well. But yeah, don't expect to might be a different beast. I don't well, know. The, the name of that ten was Arabella McKenzie. But yes. in the in the process of looking for that, I've discovered that the assistant referee in that game on Friday night, one of them, was called Hollywood. Like that can't be real, can it? Her name's Hollywood. <laughs> 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 Spelt Sorry. exactly the same as well. But yeah, that that's that's my women's rugby in, uh, interjection of the week. <laughs> what was great for me in that was it. That really did. I was like, Hollywood, what's the joke? <laughs> <laughs> it was incredibly sad. Like, whoever's watching on YouTube will see my face go, I'm not getting it. Oh, right. Cheers, Dan. Thanks for spelling it out. All I needed was the H O L L. The big sign. Yeah, Karen. Get it now, yeah. Um, I really didn't get it initially. But yeah, um, all the best to Wills Women, all the best to both Cardiff sides on the weekend. Um, anything else uh, of news or of report? I suppose the other the other news was Josh Adams' news, isn't there? Um, about his injury, Dan. Yeah, the, uh, this been reported from the press conference this week that he's sort of touch and go for well, as it's everything's framed in a Wales point of view, isn't it? With injuries to those like standard of players, so he's touch and go for the autumns. I think they're hoping in a similar way to Falatau that they might have him back. I think it's Ulster, our last game before the autumns, isn't it? Um, so that we might, if if things go well, we might see the two of them there. But to be honest, with their, you know, I put Adams in a slightly advancing age. You know, he's twenty nine. He's not. He's like not, not the youngest uh, member of the squad. With their injury records as well, I'd uh, I'd be tempted to not rush them back. And I hope that if we choose not to, then uh, then the Welsh setup also choose not to and let them have November if needed, and then they can come back out for a busy December period and. And we can manage them through to the Six Nations then. But uh, yeah, it's, it's disappointing for Adams because he, he is a guy who does love playing for Cardiff. Like one, you sometimes get a few internationals, you kind of think, oh, they're probably not too fast by club level. But Adams clearly enjoys playing for Cardiff and just enjoys playing rugby generally. So yes. uh, so I hope he is able to get back sooner rather than later and in, in proper condition, not muddling through a sort of 75%. Yeah, I don't know how true this is, but we'll we'll see it in about ten years' time. But I can definitely see a Josh Adams turning out at thirty nine for yeah. I don't know, like, sort of Gavin Henson esque perhaps yeah. for <laughs> Bargoid thirds or whatever it was on the weekend. Um, but yeah, uh, all the best to him. Um, a quick word: all the best to Ollie Griffiths as well. Following uh, sad news that he's got a serious injury. Obviously, a guy who's probably spent more time on the injury table than anyone would have liked to have seen. Um, although you know. You don't want to see anyone have any time on the injury table, but he's one who's particularly suffered from it more than most. Um, I think he's got a, a tumour near his spine, isn't that right? So his spinal yeah, yeah. yeah, he'll be out for, for the foreseeable and all the best to him. And uh, yeah, on, on that note, I'm... But, oh, sorry, first of all, I forgot to mention predictions. See, see Harley's oh, got this. Yeah, yeah, he does. He's, he's, 
Uh, <laughs> Cardiff, um, the rags, that is, go away to Quinns. Um, Quinns have had a pretty good start to the season, really, uh, win opening day. Um, who do you see winning that one, though? Uh, I'd, st- I'd still back the rags on that one. Uh, Carmarthen are a better side, and I think they've... Uh taken the they probably used the end of last premiership season to properly get ready for the start of this season and um yeah they beat Swansea and they pushed somebody all the way I cannot remember who it was off the top of my head Aberavon that's right um, Wait, to yeah, yeah they pushed they pushed them easy. big time so it won't be won't be easy there's it's always a tough place to go the park weird ground um but uh I think I think the rags by 10 probably just uh, just come out they generally have too much quality for for Carmarthen on the day. Yeah, I'm going to say a bit closer, I'm going to say Rags by six, but um, considering I haven't backed Rags in either of the games to start of the season, <laughs> uh, I am worried to do that, but no, I'm going to say it's back in their good form and hopefully they can continue it. Uh, Cardiff, oh, what then the region that is away at Scarlet is probably a bit of a tougher one to call. Yeah, on rap, I, I kind of went sort of hard over head a little bit and uh, I went Cardiff by three so I'll uh, I'll stick with that just because I, it's going to be close I, I don't it won't be many points in it either way no matter what and I, like, I don't really want to predict Cardiff to lose necessarily but I, I what I suppose what I would say is that maybe if somebody offered me a losing bonus point would I consider taking it at this point I, I, like a good performance and a losing bonus point wouldn't be the end of the world but yeah we there is we can nick it there's no reason we can't go down there and win so i'll I'll stick with cardiff by three but with uh with taking taking just any sort of points on the day would be good yeah uh obviously this is the first derby with the next one coming in two weeks time against scarlet as well yeah. but bizarre way that that's working <laughs> but i'm gonna do you know what i'm gonna back cardiff i'm gonna say cardiff by five i think I, I was impressed by Scarlet on the weekend. I thought, particularly the second half, as I said, they were much improved um, and perhaps not missing the experience as much as I feared they would. But I am going to say that Cardiff have too much for them. Um, it's a big start to the season for both, to be honest. It, it, there's so much, the real opportunity, considering Cardiff and Scarlet are both at home next week, Scarlet at home to Connacht, Cardiff at home to Glasgow, it's a real good opportunity for both to have a brilliant start to the season. Um but it'd be interesting to see who gets on top on Saturday. Um, yeah, if you are, we were going to try and work out how much a taxi was going to cost to move from Carmarthen to <laughs> to, 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 to Parker Scales, but we realised getting a taxi in Carmarthen might be too difficult. Um, but the yeah, if you want to try and do that double header, good luck to you and all the best in finding parking. But it is an opportunity to to see at least one game down west this weekend. Dan, will you be there? Yes, um, it'd be rude not to walk across town to Park Scarlet. It's really, so it's, it's not even. It's literally my closest game. It's nice not to have to drive anyway. <laughs> yeah, I, I I won't be there, but I will be working on it. So you know, make it tomorrow <laughs> and all that. Um, thanks very much to Dan. Thanks very much to you all for listening. Uh, we will be back next week, I'm sure, with another pod. Um, and yeah, as I said before, follow us on all social media channels on Twitter and and Facebook, and, and yeah, subscribe to the YouTube channel when you get an opportunity. Um, thanks very much, and all the best. Till next week. ta Cheers.